Hello, welcome to the data structures course in Middle East Technical University. I will be your instructor for this course and today today's class is a little bit of administrative stuff followed by a set of motivational examples uh, that should encourage you to do and respect data structures and then we will begin our crash course on C++ which will be the uh, main programming language in this course and I will not be able to complete the C++ stuff today due to time limits but we will go on uh, from where we left uh, and so let's begin with the administrative stuff that includes my name, my office uh, address, my email address which is more meaningful in during the pandemic days obviously uh, you can reach me at any time regarding with the questions and uh, assignments and exam etc uh, I will upload my slide sets into my own website here at this address uh, you should but follow the main what the class announcements uh, as we have other sections in this class uh, in this course so what the class is also a valuable asset for you and uh, an interesting click here is to my YouTube uh, playlist where I have the uh, stuff from my teaching in the spring of 2020 which is the previous year so uh, some of the courses are already there uh, classes are already there uh, so you should uh, check that out uh, frequently during the semester and let's begin then with uh, the other administrative stuff, no, it's not beginning obviously, let's continue. So this course uh, has the following objective. I want to, we want to introduce you uh, concepts, abstract concepts that lets you organize and manipulate data, big data, uh, properly, efficiently uh, and accurately. So this will be an essential step in problem solving in computer science we not only want to solve problems but we also want to solve them efficiently as efficient as possible and proper usage of data structures lets you do this uh, to that end I will give you this course uh, and as helpful materials uh, supplementary materials I can recommend these textbooks although they are not mandatory and the class slides, uh, course slides here will be sufficient but still if you want more organized way of uh, learning things you can follow these uh, textbooks uh, and as far as the programming language of this class it will be C++ I will show you some aspects of it obviously and I will also show you some codes but it will not be possible for you to learn this language or any other language without programming it yourself so you need to uh, find an online tutorial or something like learncpp.com is useful uh, and there are many others obviously uh, and you need to try to solve the questions there the tutorials there without looking at the solutions and you, you must not should you must implement them uh, on your own at some point uh, as far as the grading goes we will have two exams and three programming assignments that uh, in total they cover all the subjects we will deal with during the semester there will be more frequent online exercises and lab exercises so these will be uh, things that we will post online and we will put a timer on them so you will be able to solve them uh, within the time limits given to you mostly it will be uh, they will be given at weekends uh, 
yeah, so it will be a part of your grading also there is this five percent of participation in class so i am uploading these classes to youtube which is an asynchronized way of learning and teaching uh, but i also need to make sure that you are uh, you are uh, actively uh, continuing the class so to that end i will I plan to do a one hour of live session every week. Uh, it will be the it will be on Thursday on Thursdays and the time is I guess uh, it will be 14:40 okay so 2 p.m. 2, 2 past uh, 2 p.m. 2:40 p.m. Uh, yeah so in that Part, I will take participation either direct participation like attendance or I can ask very basic questions uh, so you are encouraged to come into the live sessions as well to get to grab this point 5% uh, and as far as the assignments they need to be done individually and the exams will be closed yeah so these are the things that we will deal with within the scope of this course some c++ introduction and it will give you an introduction to object oriented programming paradigm and then i will show you how to analyze algorithms objectively uh, then comes the many data structures like lists text queues trees priority queues hash tables graphs and finally we will do the sorting so enough with administrative and rather boring stuff so let's get you motivated about this course and i like this example uh, uh, so it is it goes like this you have this so-called n matrix which has non-zero values uh, laid out in the form of a letter n uh, and all other parts will be uh, zero the entries will be zero so they don't you do not want to store them explicitly because there is no information there all the information are uh, is on the X parts here so if you go naively primitively uh, and keep an n by n matrix uh, then it is not feasible it, it may be feasible but it is not efficient so for instance when n is 1 million uh, so let's uh, often do some calculations here when n is 1 million so you are dealing with a 1 million by 1 million matrix which is usually in research uh, and then you square this with another six so you will need to store this many numbers and most of which are zero so they don't really need to be stored uh, but with the proper data structure which is just a one-dimensional array in this case okay so you don't even need to think hard about it you will be using just 3n minus 2 entries and so what are they uh, since all the entries in the first column are non-zero they need to be stored so I will have uh, n for that and n for the last column so 2n and I have n entries in the diagonal so 3n but the first and last entry of the diagonal have already be, been counted so I just uh, subtract 2 from it so long story short instead of this many numbers which is 1 followed by 12 zeros uh, I will be just keeping 3 million entries in this case so 3 minus 3 million would so if you go naively you will be storing this many well uh, numbers in vain so these are just wasteful spaces so if every number is a floating point real number we need to reserve 4 bytes so 4 bytes times this many uh, 4 bytes times this huge number will be just a waste of space in your computer memory so this motivational example is by the way 
about storage efficiency so instead of uh, 10 to the power of 12 uh, entries I will be just keeping uh, 3 million uh, entries so this is not about timing this is just about uh, memory saving okay because as far as timing goes uh, this is the original array is a two-dimensional array and you will just for a query to get the i gate entry it's it is random access uh, you can just do it in one one shot so it is called constant time and in array you will also be doing it one shot so as far as timing goes you save nothing but as far as memory space goes you save a big deal okay so this is the idea but let's implement this idea so how about implementing this function set id so uh, let's recap i will convert this double array to the array into a one dimensional array where first first n uh, entries will be this first column followed by the other n entries due to this last column and followed by n minus 2 entries due to the diagonal okay so i have 3n minus 2 stuff here in this linear 1d array called a uh, but i need to find a mapping between the ij here to the uh, index in my 1d array because i will have only one index here so how to do that I encourage you to think it yourself first but let, let's do it now so this will be your function it will be like void uh, and so this will be your set uh, set and it takes two inputs I want to set the value at location ij where i is the first entry and followed by so these are the parameters to your function it is uh, very similar to the function declaration in other languages uh, so i will set the entry at ij of my 2d array of this array or matrix and i will put floating value a real value of v here okay so float v so this will be the header of my function and the black part below is your actual implementation so let's understand this so what is happening remember my uh, previous uh, figure here the, so the first column goes to the first part of this array so how do I detect that I am at the first column so let, let's go by example so this is entry 1 1 right and this is start from 1 so this guy is entry what is the entry here 2 1 this is 3 1 this is 4 1 so i want to write all of them write all of them this is 4 1 so whenever the j here is 1 see the j is constant and 1 if i am landing in the first column of my matrix so whenever i have j equal to 1 going on then i will just put it to the first part of my array so I I will so whatever I is so in this case when I is 1 I will just put this guy to the very beginning when I is 4 I will so when I is 1 I will put it to the very beginning when I is 4 I will put it somewhere here where uh, this is corresponding to index 4 etc okay so similarly how do you understand that you are landing at the uh, you are dealing with the last column so again go by example I have 8 by 8 matrix here if you can count the axis so this guy will be row 1 and column 8 similarly this is 2 8 3 8 and this guy will be 4 8 so at this point you should realize what is going on when J is the N which is 8 in the scenario then it means that you are talking about the last column of the matrix so by our definition it needs to go to this second segment 
so I first need to skip the n entries here okay this helps me do that and and then I need to advance i more because when i is 1 it means that it is the first part of this first entry of this last uh, column so it will come to the very beginning of the second segment when i is 4 it will come to the middle part of this segment so you need to do n plus 4 to come to this location okay this location yeah so that is the logic and finally i don't want to forget the diagonals so how do you detect a diagonal visit it is easy when i is equal to j it means that you are landing in a diagonal entry so by that logic this is 2 2 right this x is 2 2 and this is 3 3 and this is 4 4 so when i is equal to j it means that i am in the diagonal so i want to skip the first two n segments because n is reserved to the first column the second n is reserved to the last column and now i am in my desired segment and i need to go i many further in this part but there is a little minus one here be careful it is required because this guy one one which is a diagonal element has already been inserted when i was doing this part of the code because it is also in the first column so it means that the first entry that is coming here begins with 2 2 but I don't want to advance 2 further I want to go 1 further and that's why you need a minus 1 okay so uh, this is how you design your 1D array which will save you a big deal in terms of space complexity now let's get you motivated with an example where you save timing okay uh, so timing is also another aspect of computer science computer engineering you need to do things fastly so here the problem is i want to find the sum of a sub array as quick as possible so in this case sum query q from three to six so the answer will be the sum of the values in the gray area which is i think it's 90. so you can always run a for loop starting from a and going up to b including b and add the array value to this uh, result s and return it this is a slow way because uh, this interval can be very large it can start from index 7 and go to index 7 mil billion or something so you don't really want to go to all entries one by one and i claim that instead of doing 7 billion visits you can do it with only one visit or two visits so, but it, at most two visits you, you will be able to do it so let's call it a one shot we will see proper rigorous definitions of that when we see algorithm analysis it is called constant time algorithm where the execution time does not depend on the size of your input and currently this implementation unfortunately depends the size of my input my input is about the size of the sub array and the longer it is the longer my for loop is however with my cool tactic here okay let's come to my solution you will do it in one shot not seven billion steps so to do that i need a data structure called prefix sum array this will be another array 1d data structure but it is this is my input array a and this is what i construct as a preprocessing i call it prefix sum array so what does this hold it holds the sum of the entries from zero up to this point so this up to point two it means that all those values from one to two inclusive are added so eight similarly this will be 16 right so you get the logic so by that logic this last entry will be the sum of all the numbers in my array so why do i use this because of the following reason i think the problem geometrically so to get the sum here i will get the sum from the beginning up to the end point but now i do some excessive count so i get rid of this part so 
this horizontal bar minus this little horizontal bar will give you the sum of this region as desired. So here is that logic. Uh, I know that the sixth entry in my P array holds the sum from zero all the way uh, to the six inclusive. But now I overcount, so I need to get rid of this part, and the answer of this sum is staying in P2 because by definition P2 has the sum of numbers from 0 to 2 inclusive. So in general, so for this solution, you just go look at your um, sixth entry and then subtract the second entry. But in general, what you need to do is go to your P array, go to the, remember your interval is defined by AB, runs from A to B. So go to PB, it will give you a huge number uh, with some excessive amount and get rid of the excess by subtracting P A or A minus one, be careful at this point, A minus one, right? Because uh, if I say A, which is three in this case, I also get rid of this eight, but I want to uh, use that eight in my life, in my solution, so it should be A minus one. So see what is happening here. Your solution is just two steps. One step to get PB, second step to get PA minus one. Okay. So regardless of what A and B is, uh, you have a constant time solution, which is super nice. Uh, and then one last step, how to complete this P then, so this is my A. So in pre-processing, I will spend some time, obviously everything comes with a cost in life, but this will be a linear time action. So what is that action? The first entry of P0 is the first entry of A0, A. No questions asked, by definition. Then for the remaining guys, from 1 to n minus 1, where n is 8 in this case, so 1 to 7, uh, pi is the existing sum in the previous and uh, neighbor cell plus the current i, so current array value. So to fill p1, I go look at p0, which is 1, 1 plus 3 is 4, so 4 is done. To fill p2, I look at my previous cell which is 4, so accumulated sum, plus the current array value 4, 4 plus 4 is 8, and so on and so forth. And one nice thing about this geometric solution is uh, you can extend it to any dimension. So I encourage you to do it in 3D at home, but let, let me do it in 2D here real quick. Uh, again, I want to take the sum of the values within this region, sub-array or sub-matrix in this case. Uh, so how can I do it? Again, just like I have defined the prefix sum-array, now I can define prefix sum-matrix S. So Sx is defined as the sum of values in a sub-array from this point up to the x point. So Sa is going to give me the sum of the values in this rectangular sub-region. Okay, SA is this. With that logic, SC would be this. Okay. So let's also solve the problem, by the way. To get this sum, again, think geometrically, from SA, I get, get rid of SC. Okay, so, so far, so good. These two are handled. I also want to get rid of this region, so SB by definition from this corner all the way down to B and rectangular activity, SB is gone. But notice one thing now, this region has been subtracted twice, one due to SC, one due to SB, so I, I got too many losses, so I want to add one of the SDs back. And this will be a four shot operation, still constant time regardless of the dimension of this gray block uh, so yeah, it's a cool solution and it will help you answer this query in constant time in other words answer this query very quickly 
Okay, so these are my motivational examples. Hopefully, always we will see uh, more many other data structures, not just arrays, uh, and they will all be useful in some aspects. You need to learn all of them, and you need to be able to pick the proper one when the problem comes in front of you. Okay, so now let's do some programming. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, you need to practice on your own, but let, let me help you a little bit here. C++ is our language, which can be considered as a superset of C, an older uh, traditional programming language, which is still valid, by the way. So, superset means uh, <laughs> C programs can still compile within with your C++ compiler so you can put C segments inside your C++ program if you are a big fan of it uh, sorry about that uh, yeah so the C language is made object oriented in the C++ uh, language and I will talk about this object-oriented stuff, etc. So very basically, very shortly, I can say that C++ is C with classes. And classes resemble the struct in C, but they are more powerful. So C++ is an object-oriented programming language. And this paradigm comes with three concepts. Data abstraction, information hiding, and encapsulation. They are all related, so let me begin with the data abstraction. It is about abstracting out the details from the <coughs> outside world. So let's go with an example. You have TV, you can turn it on and off, change the volume, the channel, etc. But you don't really know the details about the signal transmission, signal handling, parsing, etc. You just hit your remote controller. So the data, the details are abstracted out from you. This is what we do with such an object-oriented programming pipeline, paradigm. For instance, you can sort an array of numbers by calling a function. You don't really know the details under the hood, but you know that you get this service. And to make this abstraction, we will use classes to define our own abstract data types. So here is a very basic class called adder. It runs from this bracket until the closing bracket and it has some services public and provided to the outer world and private is the data hidden from the outside world. So in data abstraction basically uh, we have public members like adnum or get total that are service to the outside world. Everyone can use it. By everyone, I mean another function that is outside the scope of this class, like the main function here. So I can call adnum or get total over the object of this class, where object is called a, a variable name a, and class is called adder. Okay, so this is the deal actually, not a very complicated thing. Uh, and this private part is hidden from the user, which brings me to the information hiding part. We have this authorized way of accessing from the outside world, which is this in this scenario. This object can access the public members of this class, which are the addNum function, getTotal function, uh, but it cannot access this variable directly. So if you try to do a.total, compiler will give you an error okay so this is the information hiding and the reasoning of doing this data abstraction and information hiding is as an outsider here I just know that there is a service called adnum I see it uh, which does what it needs to do I don't really want to know the details here which is not a big deal in this scenario but anyway so I am beginning with value 0 I know it because of the constructor here. Uh, when I call this, my total will be 10. When I call this, the total will be 30 because 10 plus 20 is 30, etc. 
and encapsulation is again related it is the bundling of data with the methods operating shaping that data operating on that data <clears throat> so with C++ I have uh, some features that are new compared to the old C for instance we have classes we have this authorized access mechanisms through private and public keywords we have operator overloading as well as function overloading so function overloading exists in C but operator overloading is new and very useful we have template programming which is again super useful uh, basically you write a pattern of code and you don't specify any type and during the execution time the type is bound by the compiler so the same code can be run with floating numbers complex numbers integers etc we have a relatively clean input output interface in C++ so these are the main uh, additions of to C language to get the C++ language and plus plus is a joke for incremental as you know probably so here is our first full C++ pro program uh, which includes the IO input output stream for the C out and C in stream variables they will help you print stuff out stream and get stuff in stream so C in is the equivalent of S scanf in C and C out is like printf in C so they come in this namespace called std so it is perfect okay if you write std colon colon c out but people generally don't want to go with this ugly notation so you just use this trick using namespace std meaning that we are in this namespace so you don't have to precede every c out or c in with an std we also have this end line which is uh, coming as an output stream variable so here what I do is I put terminal this text enter real number then I expect something to be entered and when I get that value in my variable x I get the square root of it which comes with this C library that I can include because remember C plus is a superset of C I can use everything from C and yeah that is it actually nothing more to discuss here uh, so this is talking about the data abstraction stuff I mentioned C out I know that it displays the text in the terminal it I don't really want to learn the implementation details how it communicates with the terminal the shell etc second program is where I do a concatenation of input so this operator is a binary operator it uh, expects input uh, two inputs so left is the stream name and right is this guy so you can concatenate them here I have concatenated it with another string or in this case it is not a string but you can put another string so instead of end line you can put the uh, new line symbol manually like this this is perfectly okay C in does the same for you in this case I expect two input uh, from keyboard and then I escape from this line after seeing two enter hits then I do the sum and print stuff etc now I can manipulate my input output a little bit to make a better uh, presentation in the screen again not so super important but uh, to introduce you to this uh, library iomanip here I tell you that uh, regardless of the number of digits after the dot I will show only two digits after the dot so zero if I have only one digit zero is added automatically and in this case only two digits and set w is like the example of this is like this you reserve six spaces uh, for your whole uh, output so 
if there are if your output is less than six spaces then uh, it will be just there will be just open spaces before it so in this scenario 36 is preceded by eight open spaces because set w is 10 again just an indentation issue so let's go to a more important stuff like classes and objects class is a type definition that includes both data properties uh, as well as the operations permitted on that data so these are the functions and these are the data like float or any other thing and object is a variable that is declared to be of some class so you can access the that classes the data and operations through that object okay so let's do this analogy when you say int x which you have done million of times i guess and then x is a variable which is an instance of type x okay and object is the same deal if you have a class called cat for instance now pick an object name let's go with c1 or cat1 now c1 is an object and c1 is an instance of the class cat so you can get some services from this class like c1.talk when you call this service it will print me out to the screen for instance okay so so object shouldn't scare you at all it is just like a variable which is an instance of a type object is an instance of a class okay so let's proceed uh, same is repeated here and here is my uh, first uh, class we have seen header before but anyway here is another class it is simulating an integer memory cell so what is it the name of the class is int cell these are the constructors we will learn more about them later these are the services like operations that act on the data of this class which is in this case this stored value so a value which is integer it will be stored when i call write it will be written as x so whatever x is that value will change when i read i will just read that value these are public so outside world can call them but they cannot just directly call this thing okay uh, yeah so public members number is visible to all returns and may be accessed by any method in any class private can be accessed only by methods in the class okay so this is again uh, going to the information hiding department mm, okay i have a class called line uh, so here i just show you the interface of it and now i implement the stuff so you can implement them here as you declare them but we will show you how to separate it properly later anyway so i have this class these two red blocks now in the main function i create an object which is an instance of line and its name is also line by some coincidence uh, I set the length of it so I, I will call it to 6 so now length of line is 6 it will print 6 then be careful I am I am not calling the set length function I am just going and accessing the length variable directly which I can do because it is declared as public but if I have put it here okay then it will be private because by default everything is private you don't even have to write private and column here then it will be a compiler but in this current scenario nothing wrong you can do it like this so constructor what is it we have seen these constructors here it's a method it's just a method it executes when an object of a class is declared and sets the initial state of the new object okay so whenever you declare this object like whenever you declare it here or in this scenario uh, we, have, we don't have a driver class for this uh, so 
listener whenever you declare it here the corresponding uh, constructor is called uh, okay uh, where am i uh, okay so the constructor is a special method is a special function its name must be the same as the class name okay it doesn't have any return type not even void so let's see our constructor here it returns nothing see you don't even put void here and the name is the same as the class name so these are handled it can have zero or more parameters um, to help you with the initialization and the constructor without any parameter without an argument is the default constructor okay uh, there may be more than one constructor as we have seen here in this case i have two constructors this is the default one because it expects no value in it so this gets called when you don't call the parameter argument version the second constructor and when you call it you set this value private value to whatever the argument here is if no constructor is explicitly defined one that initializes data members using language defaults is automatically generated which is the case here in this case there is no constructor because do you see any method called line which is the same as the class name no so the compiler will generate it for you and uh, all the data members will be defaulted to the uh, language defaults okay so let's do this in cell thing properly here is my constructor okay name matches no return type yes this is a constructor so here this is a method so you can instead of writing this let's go old school uh, you can open the brackets and do the assignment which is what stored value let, let me write st is equal to initial value it and close brackets okay so you can just do it but here is a c++ notation you follow this uh, closing parenthesis with a colon uh, and then you do the assignment and this is again a syntax issue this is the left hand side st equal to instead of equality you just use a bracket set of open and closer parentheses and put the right hand side inside okay so this constructor uh, and so what is this by the way another feature if you don't provide anything to the int cell constructor the default initial value will be zero for instance here you don't provide anything so m1 will use this zero and stored value will be equal to zero initially another declaration uses an explicit value 12 so this zero is overwritten i don't really care 12 will be used so stored value will be used will be 12 for m2 and it will be zero for m1 and m3 i will go with it later when i show you pointers okay so yeah so this is the complementary uh, part so this is my class and this is the driver uh, program where i declare the objects of class in cell okay and again this is a wrong declaration if you don't want to send any parameters you should go with this tactic and whatever default is will take action then what is what else is going on uh, i call write on m1 so remember m1 was 0 m1 dot start value so it just became 44 m2 dot write uh, so i am writing this value to the start value of m2 so initially m2 was 12 12 plus 1 is 13 so m2 dot start became 13 and so this m3 i will go to details of it later but this is a pointer so it needs to be uh, initialized with a keyword called new so don't worry about it now another class time it has private members which are generally private members are data members and sometimes some functions some methods that are not directly desirable from the outside world but that are useful to help the public methods 
Okay. In this scenario, there is only data numbers as private parts, and I have this uh, constructor. It expects three parameters. Uh, so the variable names are forgotten here. So int x, int y, int z, int z, and if they provide nothing, they will be defaulted to zero. So yeah, so it is the case here. For time one, all arguments are defaulted to zero. Zeros are here. In this scenario, so this two, it goes to the leftmost part, which would be the hour, and then minute and second will be defaulted. In this scenario, hour and minute are specified uh, manually as 21 and 34 and the second is defaulted to zero so second just goes from here and here all are specified now let's separate the interface and implementation this is an important issue uh, interface is the summary of services that are provided to the outside world it's they are just generally name of the functions and the parameters expected and implementation is a longer file where I write real code uh, write longer code to execute those uh, commitments those claims so the interface lists the class and its members and describes what can be done to an object so it is like a summary and the implementation is the CPP code for the member functions. So uh, it is common in C++ to separate interface from implementation because the interface, the set of services are generally the same. In Facebook, for instance, uh, services like traverse the graph, go visit your friends, but the algorithm that does it can be improved. So interface stays the same, like traverse, travel, see the friends, but the mechanism under the hood can be updated, so then you can modify the implementation independently, and the interface remains the same. Uh, and the writers of other classes only have to know the interfaces. They don't really know, have to know the details of your implementation. And it is a good programming project to separate implementation interface especially if you are doing a large scale project like in industry or in big research projects for small amount of coding it really doesn't matter you can put everything in one file it is still good uh, and, but if you decide to make the separation interface goes to the .h file and the implementation goes to the cpp files or sometimes at CCC as well and once you have the interface you first need to include it in the beginning of your implementation file so that the compiler knows what you are talking about so we will see a proper example of this in a second uh, one little technical detail sometimes in big projects uh, many files include try to include the same header file so this include my class dot h if you have 100 files in your project can be asked from seven other files but I don't want to include it seven times it is only enough to include one only one time because the compiler will learn the definitions of the classes only once so it will just complicate the process if I include it more than once it will lead to errors so to achieve that we use this if not def versus define tactic what is it so this is my header file uh, I started it with this if not def a variable name which is generally resembling the original class name with some underscores and etc so in the very first time that I want to compile this insult that h, it is okay because it is not defined. Yes, true. I define it and then I do the compilation and then I end if and the if, which is this if. Okay, 
And when I try to compile it second time due to another reference, then what happens if not defined int cell underscore, but it has been defined, so this becomes false. Okay, and that's why it doesn't do the block and it just quits after the end if. Okay, so that's why it's a good practice to do this if not def trick in the beginning of your interface files. Now let's do the implementation file. Uh, so again, this is the int cell dot h. This is the interface file. It is very short. It just gives you summary like the names and the parameters. And now I implement these functions. Like obviously in this toy example, implementation is not a big deal, but there may be millions of lines of code here, right? Uh, so. Uh, Another trick you need to learn is this red part. What is it? Uh, so I include the interface file and when I am filling one of the uh, proposed functions, I need to precede it by this class name, colon, colon, and the name of the function. Okay, It goes to the constructor function as well because this is also a function after all yeah so this is my uh, implementation file this is my interface file and finally I have the program file the file where I have the main function because main is a very special function it is the beginning of all the C++ programs so you need a, a special file that includes your main uh, <coughs> which is it's called generally driver program file so this is the program that uses int cell so you need to include it as well see uh, and then I declare an object of type int cell and then I go wild with it and uh, this is the driver so in summary driver func driver file implementation file and interface file okay these three are very important in C++ the structure is a related issue. It is the opposite of constructor, as the name implies. Uh, uh, it is generally done to perform termination housekeeping. So, like, since you are that object is gone, you need to clean the memory, so because they won't be used anyway. So you need to do this stuff manually in C++ and the structures are good mechanisms to do that so it is the opposite of constructor uh, so what is the trick uh, you will use the same name as the class but you need to uh, use a tilde followed by the class name okay so this tilde is important no parameter is expected okay because it's all about cleaning memory you don't initialize anything new so you don't need any parameters and there will be one destructive purpose so let me give you an example so this is just repeating me let's read the structure is a special function of a class that is executed whenever an object of its class goes out of scope okay so what does it mean you define declare an object in a function called a and when that function a finishes then that object dies because that function is finished so whenever function a closing parenthesis is reached the structure is called automatically or if you don't want an automatic call you can call it anytime by using this delete keyword we will learn more about it later so here uh, this is my constructor and this is the complementary destructor so in this scenario only memory consuming part is this because the stored value is a pointer to an integer so it will be set in the implementation file using something called new we will see it later and when I am done with this with the corresponding object this new every new must be deleted so this is like a rule of thumb uh, and you delete that thing okay and even better example for 
for time being is this in this scenario we are at a function it doesn't really matter which function you are in but this is a local object of type line I do something with it and when function ends so at this point uh, the structure is called so this guy is printed in this scenario no memory is clean because there is nothing consuming memory so I'm just printing stuff okay and that brings me to this sc uh, scope versus constructor destructor thing so we have objects of several properties like we have global scope objects which are the, these objects these are the ones that are outside of all the classes including the main all, all the functions including the main function so these are global it means that they the constructors of them are called immediately when you start the program without even waiting for the main entrance because these are global objects they are there all the time with you and the destructors of them are called when the main terminus because since these are the global objects that begin even before main they they are done when i am done with the main or when i am done with the program so it happens when the main terminus or you call the exit function which terminates the program anyway local objects uh, so here be careful constructors are called when the objects are defined so, so when the execution comes at that declaration line at that time constructor is called and the destructor is called when the uh, corresponding function finishes when the objects leave scope so if just like i mentioned if your object is declared in a function called a uh, and it's, then its destructor is called whenever you leave the function a because you are done with a when, whenever you finish executing a so you can leave a go to function b and come back to a in this scenario it doesn't call the destructor but when you are really done with the function a in other words when you hit the closing brackets of a then you call uh, then the compiler calls the destructor for you automatically and there is the static local variable so the previous one is automatic local variable what is a static local variable it is static stays it stays there forever so different from global one is constructors are not called immediately you wait for the execution to reach there then when you define or declare your object constructor is called and but when you even you leave that scope like it has been declared in a function called a but now it is declared as a static object so now when you finish the execution of a function function a uh, with this closing brackets the destructor is not called it's called when the program finishes since it is a static object and some other uh, little notation accessor function modifier function basically accessor is the reader functions read only it doesn't change or update the content of the uh, object state of the object so these are and these functions end with the keyword const so that in case you try to update the state compiler will give an error and other functions are called mutator which are allowed to change the state of an object so these are read and write they can also write but accessories read only so here in this class for instance so let's also make a quick recap again class name is complex so this is complex that's h the interface file i do the if not defined trick mentioned before here by default these are the private guys and these are the public because public is stated so everything below is public but here again you can write private and then the columns here but if you don't do it's okay the default is private so real and imaginary part of the complex number is private so it cannot be accessed outside from outside of this class let's now focus on this const issue for the accessor function so uh, this is an operator overloading issue so I will skip this function for now but print it is the most basic function of all time so here by putting constant here you guarantee that 
this print function will not update the state of the object so the state of the object is determined by the data members of it right the real r, r e and i n so let's see the print function just promised i can read them but i can never update them so if here i try to do r e equal to 7 for instance for some weird reason then the compiler will give you an error because this is a constant function and you try to update the state of the object from which this function is called similarly modulus is like the magnitude of a real number it's read only and it reads and does something mathematical with those values okay it's okay as long as r e and i m are not updated and similarly so this is an operator overloading function i will discuss it later but by seeing const you guarantee that r e will not get updated and huh, okay so i will not do the operator overloading part here but so far we have learned this so i am in a function i have an object c1 of which is an instance of class complex number complex and this c1 calls the default constructor with no parameter so let's see uh, so no parameter means the default values are zeros so real and imaginary parts will be zero for c1 for c2 real part will be one and imaginary part will be zero and for c3 real part will be one and imaginary part will be two let's quickly verify it yes one and two real x in y so i have three objects again i am skipping operator overloading part now what is happening here i should be able to understand this mistake there is a problem because c1.re be careful re is a private member as we have discussed and i am this is the inside of the scope of complex class and anywhere else is outside so i am here at a totally different file this is test complex.cpp and i try to access the private member which is forbidden so the compiler will stop here so what is the solution you can write a get re function so here which is a public part be careful so it returns float so float fl get get re get re like this and it uh, no parameter input it just returns return re this is perfectly okay uh, semicolon this is perfectly okay because uh, pub it is a public and re is private but i am accessing it from within the class of re which is complex so okay so you can call c1.get re here and now comes the overloading stuff we will begin with function overloading and then follow it by the new operator overloading feature of C++ but for today this is more than enough so let me stop here and see you next week